there, and welcome to Rewatching Veggie Tales. I'm not Bob the Tomato, Larry the Cucumber, a Bumblebee, or a Bendy Boo. Today I'll be talking about Rack, Shack, and Benny, originally released November 28, 1995. Prior to rewatching this episode, I thought that this was Laura's debut, which isn't technically true as she is in the Flibberoo segment of the previous episode, albeit in a non speaking role. It is, however, Mr. Lunt and Mr. Nether's debut, as well as George's, who I love even though I don't think he captured the hearts of the fans the way Lunt and Nezer did. He's still my boy. My grandpa boy. I actually had two family members bring this episode up recently. My dad mentioned burning alive, like Rack, Shack, and Benny, and my sister was arguing that Laura drives a spaceship, which I argued against. I don't remember how we got on the topic. We open on another actually funny countertop, where Larry is wearing an oven mitt on his head because Veggie Beat Magazine told him he wouldn't be cool without one. This is the second episode in a row where the opening countertop features Larry wearing an unusual item as headwear. And it won't be the last in that row, but more on that at the end of the video. Bob mentions a letter that brought up a similar issue to Larry's, and since Larry can't see with an oven mitt on his head, he falls into the sink. Bob rolls film on Rack, Shack, and Benny, introducing us to the Nezer Chocolate Factory security guard and our narrator, George. George immediately mentions that his favorite employee, Laura, is on her way, and she arrives, bringing us into our opening number, an absolute bop called Good Morning George. The song introduces us to Laura, a pigtailed carrot who drives what she herself calls a delivery truck. Mr. Lunt, a gourd who is the assistant to Mr. Nezer, who seems to run the factory with an iron fist, and Rack, Shack, and Benny, three factory workers played by Junior, Bob, and Larry, respectively. One of the notes I made during this song is that the cinematography and animation is notably a lot more ambitious than previous episodes, so you really have to commend the team for stepping their game up. Once the song is finished, Mr. Nezer, a zucchini, appears on screens around the factory to tell the employees that they've shipped their two millionth bunny. However, just moments earlier, George said that the factory makes 5,324,807 bunnies a year, give or take a few, which makes it sound to me like the company's only been open for around six months, which makes the following events seem a lot crazier. So anyway, our zucchini boss man tells the factory workers that to celebrate this momentous occasion, they're allowed to eat as many bunnies as they want. Since Mr. Nezer's using child labor, they of course all go ham. As all of the other workers are stuffing their faces, Rack suggests that gorging themselves all they can eat style is mayhaps not the best idea, reminding Shaq and Benny that their parents told them that too much candy is bad for them. He sings them a little lullaby that his mom used to sing to him before he was shipped off for child labor. And Shaq and Benny are moved to tears, agreeing that a few bunnies were okay, but it's best to not go overboard. It's around this time that Mr. Nezer and Mr. Lunt decide to head to the factory floor to see just how appreciative the workers are. All except our main three are lying on the ground with tummy aches. This prompts Mr. Nezer to promote the boys, making them Junior Executive's TM emoji. The next day, assuming their new roles as Junior Executive, ties and all, the boys are called into Nezer's office, where he reveals his plans to erect a 90-foot tall bunny statue, make all the employees bow before it, and sing the bunny song. And look, I know Mr. Nezer is a stand-in for Nebuchadnezzar from the Bible, but why am I getting the feeling that Nezer Chocolate Factory is an analog for the Disney College program? Like, think about it. He hires kids to work all the time. And if you swipe out the word bunny for mouse when Nezer says, the bunny song is how all my employees will show just how much they love the bunny. Nothing is more important than the bunny. How they would do anything for the bunny. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. And before anyone says anything, this is a joke. I am a former Disney programs graduate. I would very much like a second contract. Sometimes I use hyperbole on the internet and attempts to be humorous. But anyway, Nezer then launches into the bunny song, a song about worshipping chocolate bunnies and not eating anything but those chocolate bunnies. Rack, Shack, and Benny are uncomfy and ask what would happen if someone were to just, you know, not. Nezer tells him that he'll burn them in the furnace that they use for the bad bunny molds, and the boys are like, uh-oh, sisters. At the unveiling of the bunny statue, Nezer makes all the employees bow before it. 
But since all but the main boys and Laura are peas, it just looks like they're lying face down on the ground. Which, I mean, if I was an overworked child, I would also do that. But the boys, of course, do not bow before the giant bunny. And Mr. Lent says, maybe they're stuck, which made me laugh way more than it should have. Nezer asks the boys to sing the song. Instead, they sing the lullaby Rack sang earlier. Mr. Nezer decides to throw them into the furnace. Which is the perfect time to launch into a silly song. Larry sings Dance of the Cucumber in its original Spanish, while Bob translates. I'm just gonna say it, folks. This is the first great silly song. Hairbrush and water buffalo stand do not interact. But everything about it comes together in the perfect storm of what a great silly song segment should be. The premise itself holds up hilariously, and the song is catchy. We stand Larry, a bilingual king. We stand Uncle Louie's Spoke Party. We stand that weird pause in the middle for the Epcot of it all. And can I just say, as someone who spent 13 months in authentic Canadian garb, the joke still hits. One weird thing I do want to note is that in the particular video I was watching, Larry's Adios Amigos was edited out, but he's still on screen, in frame, with his lips clearly moving. After our trip to Vegcot, we reopen on our boys R.S. and B, who are tied up and about to be thrown into the furnace. Nezer then launches into a reprise of the bunny song titled I Tried to Be Patient that I legitimately forgot happened, and it's honestly a top-tier villain song. And not just for VeggieTales, like, in general. Laura soon intervenes and puts the tied-up boys in the back of what I finally must concede is a spaceship, no matter how many times they call it a truck. My sister wins this round. Nezer manages to grab the ship and proclaims nobody's ever going to stand up to me again. Though should we be surprised that the same guy who enforces child labor and capital punishment is opposed to unions? Absolutely not! However, God is with the boys in the furnace and Nezer has the quickest villain reform I have ever seen. After admitting his faults and apologizing, the boys offer to teach him one of their songs. In stand, slaps. Junior's little, oh yeah, at the end, cured my depression. So much has happened in the last 25 minutes that when we come back to the countertop, I had legitimately already forgotten that Larry was still in the sink. This is also the first time that what we have learned today song doesn't play, but Larry sings it instead, don't worry. The closing countertop for this episode is definitely the funniest one yet. There is a lot that happens that had me giggling, including Bob turning the faucet on Larry to make him stop singing the What We Have Learned song, and Larry being absolutely cold-blooded and leaving Bob in the sink. It also took me until the closing countertop to realize that this is the first episode that started that trend of Larry needing to be taught a lesson, and the lesson gets taught in the form of a movie he just starred in. This is a formula that comes back repeatedly, especially after Jonah, and thinking about it for more than just a second always makes me chuckle. Like, the implications. Overall, this episode held up a lot better than I thought it would. It was a lot funnier than I remembered, all of the songs are absolute classics, and the lesson is explained clearly, in a child-friendly way, without feeling like overkill. In terms of characters, Nezer absolutely shines in his debut. A character who's honestly been the most morally reprehensible in the series so far manages to be incredibly charismatic. Phil singing in that lower register is always impressive to me, given how many of his other characters are tenors. Nezer really shows off his range. I know supporting Phil's voice acting as Nezer might be hashtag controversial. My defense is that as a kid, I didn't get any of the suggested undertones, and I grew up with Nezer, who was a character who grew and changed so much, that years later, I still hear Nezer in this performance, not the voice performance he was initially modeled after. While I did praise the cinematography earlier, and rightfully so, the animation on this episode doesn't hold up very well by today's standard. However, I'd argue that the story is so strong that younger children or adults revisiting would easily be able to overlook it. And that's all the time we have for today, kids. Remember, it's all fine and dandy to enforce child labor just so long as you don't threaten to put any of those children in danger. And speaking of people being in danger, next week marks the first appearance of someone who could put a stop to that. I guess you could say I'm super excited.